we cannot go too far with Christ, but we can go too far with what we brand and define as Christianity. Hello there, this is Too Hot for Radio. Stuart is joining me as usual. My name is Tom and uh, we talk about issues, things concerning Christ, culture and the church. Now we're going to talk about Brian Head Welsh. I guess I'd be interested first, Stuart, to know, had you heard of Brian Welsh before? About a week ago, one of the video podcasts that I listen to regularly is uh, Revealing Truth. And so it's only because I listened to that, the guy that does that, that I was aware of this chap and, and this uh, situation. You know, for some, it might not seem like a major story, but obviously this grabbed my attention because of my history. Putting it very briefly, when I first got into heavy metal music, I'm pretty sure it was one of the first albums that I bought on cassette in terms of metal band was a band called Corn, and that album called Life is Peachy and it covers very dark themes. The lead singer Jonathan Davis worked in a mortuary for some years, also was sexually abused uh, when he was younger and so a lot of themes about death and about abuse and violence and the, the music itself is very sludgy and heavy they became uh, basically the forerunners, the, the godfathers of new metal, which was a genre of music that I got massively into as a teenager. And so I have listened to countless hours of the band Korn. And when I became a Christian at 18 years old, Korn was still going strong. And I had this kind of wrestle within myself, which in some ways I still have, as to what I can and can't listen to. Not in terms of legalism but in terms of what is healthy uh, and I can't remember how old I was a number of years after that Brian Head Welsh who's the lead guitar player of Corn, came out as a Christian and he had been struggling in his marriage and struggling to parent his child he was a drug addict said he was in a very bad way kind of suicidal had kind of got everything he ever wanted you know sex drugs and rock and roll the band were absolutely massive and he ended up kind of, you know, coming to the end of himself and just realizing uh, he needed something to change. And um, long story short, he ends up going to church and he accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He automatically quits the band Corn. At that point, all seemed very encouraging. He quit drugs, went cold turkey, seemed to kind of get his life back in order. He started writing a book and his book that was released was called Save Me From Myself. And I remember buying the book and reading it really quickly because I was just, for me, so excited that this guy who had been in this scene uh, that had been important to me before I was a Christian had kind of become a Christian. So I was fascinated in the journey. Then things started to get a bit weird, I'll be honest. Uh, he started to associate with John Crowder. And I remember seeing videos of him, I think it's like smoking, pretending to smoke the Holy Spirit. Uh, like it was a uh, a spliff. And this idea that the high you get from God is better than the high you get from drugs. I remember seeing a video of him rolling around on a table, shirtless, and just talking about how amazing God's love is. And it sounded to me like he was drunk. And the, the way he was talking about the love of God was like almost a sexualized way, which just seemed really, really strange. The thing that has grabbed our attention for this, though, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm aware that I am talking for a long time here, just trying to set the scene, was uh, he was recently interviewed by Rob Flynn, who is the uh, lead singer and lead guitar player of the band Machine Head. And Brian basically said that his early days of being a Christian, he had kind of gone a bit militant and, and a bit crazy. And in a sense, Christianity had become his new drug. And now number of years after that he's calmed down and he would still call himself a Christian I think but uh, would be far more would be quieter in a sense in his faith and nervous of the excesses of Christianity and and seeming weird and, and and all those things 
So that was what grabbed our attention, really. And obviously, you saw the video from Re Revealing Truth. Stuart, what do you make of, of all of that? I know there was a lot of information there. The quote that I think that galvanized you in regard to should we do this for the podcast was when he said, this is Brian Welch, I got obsessed with Christianity just like I was obsessed with drugs. Can we say that about Christianity? I think we can, Tom. Yeah. Because to me, what is revealing about this chap, Brian Welch, and where he's at and where he's been is all, really what he didn't say. I think there are a lot of people who go to extremes. It struck me that he didn't say, I got obsessed with Christ. Now, that might just be people might say, well, shoot, you're splitting hairs. But actually, no. I can think of numerous examples of people who go to an unhealthy, ugly extreme with what they term as Christianity, but is nothing to do with Christ. So, for example, what about Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas? You've heard of them, Tom. Absolutely. You know, they're labeled the most hated church in the world with their hate speech against Jews and atheists and Muslims and uh, the LGBTQ community. The terrible language that these self-professed Christians talk, they go and they picket homosexual funerals. I just think that has nothing to do with Christ. I'll probably not win any more friends, not that I had a great deal in Northern Ireland anyway from my time there. But another example is the Orange Order that uh, traditionally was Christian at the roots, but has not been for quite a while. They march down the street, Tom, under the banner for God and Ulster. That's their banner. But yet some of them will urinate outside the Roman Catholic chapel. Or when they're coming on the march or leaving the march, they'll go to a pub and get drunk. And as I said many times when I lived there, it might be for Ulster, but that's not for God. There's no way this Brian Welch can know God if he's going down the road that he's going. Well, I would disagree with that. I think there are a number of things to be concerned about, and that's where I disagreed with revealing truth. We've got to be careful not to be too quick to make a call on where someone is at, but that doesn't mean that we cannot point out areas that seem like real issues or contradictions in their life or unbiblical behavior. A lot of this story shows wider issues in the Christian world, if that's, if that's even a thing. I think he genuinely had a life change. One of the, the biggest YouTube videos was that guy, uh, the, the spoken word poem of I love Jesus but hate religion. I understand the, the point. We're not about re religiosity. We're not about simple observance to pharisaical rules. But we are too quick sometimes to throw out the religion badge because actually James says this is what true religion is, to care for orphans and widows in, in need. Like we, we can be too quick to just say it's all about a relationship, even though the relationship with Christ is at the heart of it. I think Brian Welsh could have done with a bit more religion, as in, don't mishear me, getting stuck into a church and being discipled and mentored as he should be. And to recognize that he is a, if he is saved, that he is a babe in Christ. And so one of the things that we find uh, so often is when someone famous has an experience or becomes a Christian, we just latch on to them so quickly. And I did this absolutely with him. I was like, yes, now we've got one. We've got a big name. We've got someone who's in the, the, the rock world. We were too quick to try and use him, too, too quick to to get him to write a book, too quick to have him speaking at churches. If you've had a genuine experience that, that you do have that cage stage of your faith, do you know what I mean, when you first become a Christian, you're just blown away by the love of Christ and you can't believe that there would be anyone that wouldn't believe. And so there can be a, a recklessness to the way that you share your faith and you're desperately trying to get people uh, to believe what you believe. It can be a kind of passion without knowledge a passion without maturity but most of us often look back on those early days of kind of fervor and, and first love in our faith very affectionately as in I often pray God take me back to there would you birth in me that first love mentality because I'm far too comfortable today to not share my faith I'm far too comfortable 
to focus on theology than on my discipleship. And am I becoming more and more like Christ every day? So I think we were, the Christian world was far too quick to claim him, far too quick to use him. And uh, he then got caught up, I think, with people that are far too quick to dismiss religion and only focus on a relationship. And it can simply become a self-help thing that it's ultimately believe in Jesus and he'll clean up your life and that's it. Well, yes, Jesus does that, but also Jesus calls us to radical discipleship. I was thinking of Luke chapter 14, where everyone's following Jesus. They're like, he's amazing. He's doing amazing miracles. Oh, I love his teaching. And then Jesus says, if anyone comes after me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And then down to verse 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciple. The fact is, discipleship is costly. Discipleship is a complete life change. For Brian to be looking back on those early days and saying, I went too far, maybe I was a little bit zealous, maybe Christianity became a bit of a drug. I'm sure, and as you've said, Stuart, you, we can go too far, but we can also go too far the other way and have Christianity just be tagged on to our lives with everything else. And it's just, yeah, you're, I'm a Christian. Yeah, you're not. Oh, you know, you're, you're a Muslim. Yeah, you, you know, and it just becomes a, an add-on, an additional extra. Christianity has to be the first and foremost, the primary thing in your life is your relationship with Jesus, which is more important than family, more important than music, more important than anything else. I don't think we can say that he is not saved and that Jesus has not done a work in his life. But I think the company he has kept have not served him well, but also he needs to be a big boy, pull up his pants as well, and recognize the danger of his old life that he freely went back into when he rejoined the band. And I always thought that was a really sad point when he went back to the, to the band that, in a sense, was part of his downfall and part of the issues in his life. I don't know his current situation, but really, I'd be hoping that there'd be some Christians around him who could give better counsel. Yeah, I mean, when you were talking there, Tom, you know, I thought about Kanye West. Yeah. Another high profile figure who I think we have uh, mentioned in one of our, our very early podcasts. But, you know, here's the guy who calls himself the most gifted performer in the history of humanity. And he wasn't saying it tongue in cheek. I watched the interview. Why would Jesus not choose the most gifted performer in the history of humanity to be a messenger of his gospel? Now, to me, that's a man that doesn't know God. Now, let, let me, and I still say this about Brian Welsh, A.W. Tozer talked about those who refer to God as the man upstairs or the big man. And Tozer said, anybody who refers to God in that way cannot know him. Because if you did know him, Tom, you would never refer to him in that way. My point is, just because somebody said, like Brian Welch, and by the way, I hope I'm wrong. I hope he'll be in heaven, and I hope he gets right. So I'm not saying this in any sense of rubbing my hands in glee. I hope you understand that, and, yeah. and those listening do. But just because somebody said that they have had an experience with Christ doesn't mean they have. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. In Matthew 7, for example, Jesus talks about, you know, the narrow way and the narrow gate and the root and the fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, and even does great things in my name and things which are miraculous that could have no other explanation, but it must be God. There are even those whom Jesus at the end of the day will turn around and say, I never knew you. And also, I, I went to Matthew 13 when uh, I was listening to you talk there, because Jesus told the parable of the soils or the sower and the different hearts, the different soils. He talked about those who received the word with joy. Would they not turn around, Tom, and say that they had an, an experience? Yeah. You know, or who received the word and then the distractions and troubles of life come. Would they not have turned around and said at one point they had an experience what did Jesus say was, the, was the, the common denominator? He says it more than once. Because they had no root 
and it's from the root that comes the fruit. Now, you mentioned to me last week, before you and I were aware of this, it was just when we were talking, getting ready to do one of our podcasts, and you said that you'd watched a little video clip of Leonard Ravenhill. Now, I don't want to steal your thunder. I don't know if you want to. I think it's time for you to to bring on the impersonations. So, oh, uh, no, no, no. I'm, I, I'm not going to impersonate him because I watched it this morning. He said it's an interview and he said that he no longer asks people, are they saved? You know, because he says every, everybody's saved from the White House to the jailhouse. You know, <laughs> the question is, does Christ live in you? Does Christ live in me? Remember what Paul said in in Galatians 2 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then do you remember what he said in Philippians uh, chapter 3? And I'd like to read these verses, Tom, just to get context. Whatever was to my prophet, Philippians 3 verse 7, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And so when he goes back into into really the occult, I would say, in terms of what that whole genre and genre it's not even the right word of, of, of music, in particular regard to what that group is associated with. Mm. When he goes back into that, is there anybody who can legitimately say, well, that is the life of Christ in him? That is for what Christ laid hold of me. And then just one more reference, Tom, and then I'll just say one more thing and then throw it back to you, if that's okay. Colossians 2, 16 through 19 Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or Sabbath day. See, we can go to an extremes in religion. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen. And his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head. And the head is Christ. And so it doesn't matter what a person really is saying. Show us the fruit. Show us the fruit. I often ask when I'm preaching, why is it that so many once wholehearted sinners are now such half-hearted saints? The Bible never records Judas Iscariot ever as calling Jesus Lord and that is why he was able to do what he ultimately did and I would say is this not the issue of why we can do the things we still do and yet profess to know Christ we cannot go too far with Christ but we can go too far with what we brand and define as Christianity that was what was so intriguing about him becoming a Christian and leaving the band was quite a statement, really. I wondered even at that point, I wonder how ostracized he will be and how kind of um, mocked and ridiculed he'll be for believing in Jesus. Because the metal scene, the heavy metal scene that he came out of is full of imagery and language that is kind of anti-gospel, anti-Jesus uh, uh, a lot of the time. Particularly the heavier the music you go into, the more imagery they use of kind of uh, satanic imagery and, and things like that. Without question, very dark imagery and 
a lot about depression and, you know, suicidal thoughts and kind of nihilistic, really. Life is meaningless. Life is purposeless. It's only pain. And so I was intrigued to see what would happen, how much he'd be ridiculed. And really, he was in, in many ways ignored and not a lot was, was, was really said in the metal world. But it was very much needed and it's still very much needed. And so I was hoping that because actually in other kind of cultures or other lifestyles or, you know, genres, even people are less interested in spiritual things. And the thing is, the metal community, although it is all rather dark, often there is a real interest. Do you know what I mean? I remember I used to work with young uh, moshers and goths and skaters and punks in the city centre of Manchester. You know, it's far easier to to start a an evangelistic discussion with someone wearing a T-shirt that says "Vote Satan" than someone who's wearing you know what I mean, the Tommy Hilfiger T-shirt, and they're not interested. You know what I mean? So apathetic about anything to do with God. These people are angry uh, and they don't know why. You know, and so at least uh, I prefer anger in a sense to apathy. When it comes to that. And so I just felt like he had an, a wonderful opportunity because of the platform that he had to be able to really speak into that will. The problem is it isn't accepted and there's no way that he could hold the same position and hold the line with what the Bible says about all manner of issues. And so he just went very quiet and then obviously has gone back in to that. And, you know, the verses that I thought of were in uh, Ephesians 5 starting verse 8 for you were once darkness but now you are light in the Lord live as children of light for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them and so if Brian uh, Welsh is a true believer then it is his call to to be a child in the light and to uh, to pursue the things of the Lord, to, to love Jesus with his heart, soul, mind and strength and to not kind of flirt with the darkness, but to expose it. And I would imagine he would see himself as doing that. I'm going to be an evangelist in, in the band, in the scene. But I, I do think at the moment, my hope is that he is more misguided than deceived on this. A phrase that you often use in, in most of the topics that, that we end up dealing with in these podcasts is a cautionary tale. I think this is another cautionary tale, not only in terms of the church's responsibility, which scripture prohibits us, as you rightly said, about laying hands on someone who professes Christ too quickly and putting yeah. them up as some kind of trophy. You know, we need to nurture people and disciple them well. But here's the other cautionary tale. Let's all be mindful that we can all make a wrong turn and go back into things or even new sinister things where we've never been. Uh, we, we, we all have that potential outside of Christ. But I am not for one moment suggesting that um, it's, it's more his reaction to this, Tom, that would trouble me to say, does he really know God? Because when somebody who really knows God, it's not that they cannot sin, and really mess up terribly. It's when they do, Tom, there's contrition and there's 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 grief over that. He's not pointing the finger from what I can see at himself. He's saying, this is what was wrong with the system, if you like, and I embraced the wrong part of it. He's not taking personal responsibility, but how you can go back into that, that's certainly not the answer. To any shortcomings there might be in the church or religion is to just go back but to go back into that and not exhibit any kind of of grief over that 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 how as you say can i fit into this anymore you know when peter denied jesus the bible says he went away and wept bitterly yeah. how many of us when we fall into sin weep bitterly and i think that is uh a really good place to finish. We may well return to this from a slightly different angle at some point in the future. And if that's something that you would be interested in, please do let us know. As always, please do like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Please do comment if you're listening uh, and uh, rate us. Thanks yeah. so much. And yeah. we will uh, we will see you really soon.